Hi everyone, this is Maura Sweeney and welcome to the latest episode in the ABCs of Now series. You know that we are going through a time of seismic shift and change between one world or era and the next. And in this ABCs of Now series, we've been going through the alphabet from the end back to the beginning. In each episode, taking a letter of the alphabet along with a word. And that word, we kind of break open and look at it as if it was some elementary idea or concept that had been formulated in our collective consciousness. And looking at it again to say, all right, we are obviously in a time of unbelievable change. How are the thoughts we carry, the ideas that we were all taught, or let's say we adopted and adapted ourselves to, how are they faring for us? And are they able to move forward with us, let's say, into the days to come? Well, the last episode we covered was episode 23 of this ABCs of Now, and we got the letter D as being for destruction. And in that particular episode, we learned that maybe destruction, as we've been taught the concept, isn't necessarily as bad as we thought it was, especially since we learned that destruction really has to do with unbuilding, as if we're taking some things down that really weren't necessary for the time in which we're moving forward. And we also talked about the Pisces age or era that lasted, let's say, about the past 2,000 years that was really defined by things like money, power, and control. And now we're evolving or moving forward into what's thought to be the Aquarian age. Let's call it the end of conquest of man killing, plundering, and subjugating his fellow man. And instead, an era where peace, harmony, humanitarian perspectives of the world around us, and even things like transparency, the end of secrets and deception, are all laying before us. It's a big process to think about, and that's why we've been taking them all in small nuggets. But when I got finished, soon after, with the most recent episode on the letter D, suddenly I started getting all these additional thoughts, and I thought, well, this isn't a letter of the alphabet. What am I going to do with it? And I realized I'm going to put it in just as a special episode. Maybe I'll call it episode 23B in the series because it does not have to do with a letter with a letter of the alphabet. Here's what was coming to mind. With all of the thoughts we've been covering in this series, many of them are, let's say, conceptual in nature, but they're not necessarily addressing the more practical side, and that was what kept coming to me, as if there were people out there thinking, Maura, I know what you're saying, I'm following this, and I, I've been getting quite a few um, people coming back to me and giving me feedback and talking about the timing and how these things are speaking to them, but yet, something was hitting me that we need an episode that deals with us as individuals on a more pragmatic level. So. What I was given as a title for this is your influence in the now. It's the same time period, the now that we're living in, but this time the focus is on you, the listener, on me, the speaker, on every single one of us, our personal influence in the here and now. And so these are the things we're going to be discussing today. First, as always, I'm going to introduce the word influence and a couple of definitions that go along with it. I'm also going to give us a word picture so that you could maybe kind of get a, a better feel for what influence means. We're going to talk about the origin of influence, which is quite interesting. And we're going to talk about influence as a form of energy. After that, we're going to touch on the Matrix movie. Following that, we're going to talk about a few examples of, let's say, feeling like we're living inside the matrix where money, power, and control operates over others in some common ways and also how those controls can be broken, neutralized, 
or even dissolved by us as individuals. After that, I'm going to offer a very old word concerning the concept of choice, where each one of us has choices to make that we may or may not be aware of. And then I'm going to talk about examples of making choices. After that, we're going to talk about the concept of the hologram. The hologram. Some wisdom after that is going to come from a woman that I met with 30 years ago whose words are probably more precisely appointed for today than ever before. And we're going to talk about the secret of the hologram. And lastly, we're going to talk about things that you can actually do in your own life to give yourself that feeling of the power and energy of influence that you have. All right. So to start, it sounds like oh, I sometimes I look at all this stuff and I'm like, how am I going to get this into a single podcast? Well, let's see how we do today. Let's start again with the word influence, since that's what this is all about. Your influence and your influence right now. All right. The definition for influence is this. It's the capacity to have an effect either positively or negatively on the character, development, or behavior of someone or something, or the effect itself. It's the action or process of producing effects on the actions, behaviors, opinions, etc. of another or others. Now, I told you I would give you a word picture for this because sometimes you could hear words and think, oh, so what does that mean? Here's the best word picture I've come up with. I want you to imagine a perfectly still lake, a body of water. It's not moving, absolutely still. And it's the middle of the day where it's very bright outside. And you take a small pebble and you throw it into the perfectly still lake. Well, what happens? Suddenly, not only does that tiny little pebble make... um, a pierce through the water in the lake, but it causes a ripple effect. And if you've ever seen it take place, what you'll notice is that there are circles that appear in ever increasing waves around where you inserted or plopped in that petal into the lake. That is a picture of influence. Now, beyond that, I want to tell you, there's a little bit of I want to say the esoteric or the magic of the word influence. If you ever looked into the origin of the word from a very, very long time ago, the origin of the word influence is actually an astrological term. It is known as an ethereal, meaning light, airy, or extremely delicate, heavenly, or celestial, um, or even something relating to the upper regions of space, an ethereal power from the stars that acts upon the destiny or destinies of men. I'm going to repeat it again. The origin of influence is an astrological term best thought of as energy. It's an ethereal power from the stars that acts upon the destiny or destinies of men. Now, I mentioned to you that the origin of influence has to be thought of as energy, meaning something unseen rather than seen. And yet the unseen has an effect in the seen world. So if I could look up the word energy, these were some of the things that I found, and I, this may give you something to play with mentally. It's a dynamic quality. And when I thought about the word dynamic, I thought about dynamite. Do you ever think about the power that comes from dynamite? It's already there, but with the right, I guess the right match to it, there's a lot that goes into it and a lot that comes out of it. Energy is also described as the capacity for vigorous activity or available power. It's a usually positive spiritual force. 
and I loved the way that felt. Usually positive spiritual force. It's also known as a fundamental entity of nature that is transferred between parts of a system in the production of physical change within the system, and it's usually regarded as the capacity for doing work. Finally, energy is discussed or defined as usable power, such as heat or electricity, or the resources for producing such power. Now, that's what your influence is. It's a form of energy. Ideally, it can be used for positive purposes, and that's where I aim to go with this today. Now, I told you next I was going to talk a little bit about the Matrix movie. I don't know if I told you I was going to talk a little bit about it or a lot. To be honest, as full disclosure here, I've never watched the Matrix, but I know that when it hit the marketplace, I guess it was in 1999, it was a science fiction film with Canoe Reeves. Many of you listening have probably seen it or many seen it multiple times, but it's all about a society where people lead dehumanized, I want you to think about this, dehumanized, fearful lives. This is all about a story where people were living inside a simulated reality that was controlled by intelligent machines. And somehow Neo, the computer hacker, is the one who uncovers the truth about what's really going on, and he joins a rebellion against these controlling, maybe you'd call them AI machines at this point. Now, I told you I never watched the movie, even though I was familiar somewhat with the plot and the concept behind it. Well, a friend of mine was talking about this one day, and I know that it, the movie meant a lot to her in terms of decoding the world. And I said to her, I said, you know, I'm really not one for science fiction. I said, but would you tell me what your biggest takeaway was in that movie? Because there's so many things to watch and to learn about these days that if I could get cliff notes from someone that are meaningful, that'll be the takeaway for me. Well, what she told me I thought was so powerful. She said her major takeaway from the film was this. She said people, individuals just like us, were unknowingly, or let's say unwittingly, an energy source that was giving power to these intelligent machines. Now imagine this. That means that when I, we just talked about the word influence, and influence is an energy, or a power that each one of us possesses. And here's a movie called The Matrix, and people within The Matrix had no idea that their very source of energy, the source of who and what they were, the source that could, could have been used for positive or negative means that could have given life or taken it away, was surreptitiously, deceptively, being sucked off of them, sucked away, and being used by intelligent machines. The truth was, and the truth is, that the power is we the people and not the controlling elements of society. So it was actually that the reverse is the reality of what we presumed or assumed about the world. And that's why I believe this episode on influence is so important because it's aiming to reverse. Even though we're going, as you know, we're going backwards in the alphabet in this series. Today, we're actually reversing our thinking in terms of who we are in society and really what the greater society would be like without us there to, let's say, siphon off and utilize our energy for its own means. I want to give you some examples of the world we've been living in. Now, remember we talked last uh, episode about how the previous, let's say, Pisces era, the one we're coming out of, has been, let's say, typified by things like money, power, and control. And I want to give some common examples or some recent examples of how it can be broken or neutralized or dissolved. Just last weekend, 
I had time to chat with a friend's daughter. She was visiting from out of town. I was actually surprised to see her. It turns out she was between jobs and had time for a short break. So she got on an airplane, came to Florida, was visiting with her mom. And a very delightful girl, maybe 29, 30 years old. Very, very pleasant. And you could see just a really nice girl. So I obviously wanted to know how life was going, how work was going, etc., And all of a sudden her eyes just, oh, it just, they just um, turned, turned on to light. That's probably the best way to say it. Her whole face lit up and she said, well, do you know I'm here because I was between jobs, but I'm starting a new job. And I could say, well, it's obvious you're very excited about this. And she said, oh, I am. Now I knew she had worked for several banks or she was in the finance industry just earlier, but she had left a previous job and was taking this new position at a new company that apparently is run by a young female CEO uh, who's been very, very successful with it. I can't tell you all the ins and outs of the company, but I will let you know the most salient parts that hit me because I believe they will relate to so many other people. She said, Maura, everybody that I've been speaking to at this company, she said there's such a different dynamic. She said, Everyone has such a positive and a much freer feel about them or vibe about them. And she said, it really made me happy. She said, you know, I had gotten to know a woman from California who's been with the company maybe six months to a year. And she said, this woman told me that she said, you know, my last position, um, I used to always get the Sunday scaries. She said, I was always afraid to go to work on Monday because of what I was under. She said, now working in this company, I don't have it anymore. She said, I love this company and I'm so happy to be with it. It was positive energy that she was exerting and let's say diffusing in a positive environment. And when I heard that word Sunday scaries, I have to tell you, it reminded me of so much of my former life even as a manager in corporate life, because there was so much anxiety that would all often go along with the need to um, produce, produce, produce. Well, the same young girl also happened to tell me that her previous position that she left, she said, you know, Maura, she said, I was working in a call center and she said the phone was constantly ringing and she said you'd hang up with one client and you'd all automatically get the next phone to pick up she said there was never an instant where we were off the phone and so my thoughts went to well how do you how do you take a bathroom break and as if by reading my mind she said do you know we didn't even have bathroom breaks she said i would have to wait until i could have one later on it had to go along with a 15 minute break and so she was basically creating an environment for me to imagine her in her previous job where she was ultimately controlled by money and power and the fear that went along with it the intimidation factor she had said she had several other things which would be too much to go into now but here she was moving from one environment to another and suddenly the energy that she could use in her new job could be used in a positive way and she could be spending her money doing her and her energy rather doing what she loved all right I want to give you another thing that struck me and it was recently I was somewhere working on a project let's just say I was by myself in a corner someplace working on a project when I noticed a supervisor call over one of his staffers now this was on a Friday afternoon and he suggested to her that she go home Well, her first response was, did I do something wrong? And I could see the look of almost panic on her face, even though it was not a panicked environment at any level. Well, when the supervisor suggested that she had already completed her work for the week, she was stunned. She said, well, yeah, I've pretty much done everything I needed to. And he said, well, I don't see that there's anything more you need to do. So he said, well, then why don't you leave work early and go home? Well, the woman, I have to tell you, was stunned, like stunned as if like, is this really happening to me? Is there a camera somewhere that they're catching this moment? Because I can't believe this just happened to me. She was so overjoyed and she put her hand out to shake her supervisor's hand. And she said, thank you very much. And all it meant for her, it was 3.30 in the afternoon, is that she was going to add another hour and a half 
to her weekend. And the woman couldn't have been any more delighted. And I looked back at the supervisor and I thought, good for him. This is a good supervisor who's watching out and paying attention to and aware of the good efforts. One of his employees came in and wanted to reward her in what was really a small gesture. And yet the energy of his position in giving that that extra hour and a half to her on a Friday afternoon went so far. That is surely going to be a situation that will come back yet again from that staffer with greater, I would say, greater faithfulness, fidelity, interest, engagement in her work, and an appreciation for the person that she works for. And those are two things that had to do with influence in, let's say, an older world as we're transitioning into a new. But there's a third one that came to mind, and this is actually from a long, long time ago in like a previous life of mine. For about a decade, I worked in two large corporations and I was overseeing my own staffs. I was working one for a national corporation, the other for an international corporation. But every time I had jobs, I was overseeing various branch offices, which meant that although I had a lot of the pressures, I still had my own, let's say, satellite locations to work from. And I remember this as I was driving home that Friday afternoon from the place where I was working on this project, watching the previous description I just offered to you. And I thought, oh my gosh, I remember not wanting to be in supervisory or management leadership positions because I thought, oh my gosh, I never want to be nasty with people. I never want to lord anything over with people. But do you know, I ended up being a manager who very often would give people Friday afternoons off. And I would do it because they had their work finished. In fact, if truth be told, I even did it with my daughter when she was homeschooling. We always set goals up to say, what kind of work do we need to get done? And what could we do as a reward after it's over? And the energy changed so dramatically, whether it was in my corporate environment um, with people that worked extra hard because they knew they were going to get extra time off and they felt like they were ready to celebrate and other people in the office would help them get there. And there were times when some people were taking off on a Friday afternoon and others would stay behind to answer their calls, but they knew that there would come a time where they would reciprocate and they would help their fellow worker by being the one that would be out on a Friday afternoon and their fellow worker would stay behind and answer their calls. The same was true with our daughter because she knew there was an incentive to doing well and there was a reward. Better said, there was life, life being added to life as a result of doing something or engaging something. Well, do you know many of us are caught, and I literally mean caught. I want you to think of being almost caught like in a spider's web, in an energy-draining matrix, which at times makes us think and believe and actually experience the sense that, let's say, money, power, intimidation, control, and conquest to the point where we believe it's This is the norm. This is the way it always is. This is the way it's always going to be. That idea of always being under something, always feeling restricted. Well, did you know that it doesn't always have to be that way, but it can become that way because we unwittingly and without realizing it, give our energies to those environments because maybe everybody else around us gives those energies and we don't realize that we can, let's say, remove some of our energies from it. And by doing so, make that supposed spider's web or matrix or world environment less potent from what it used to be. All right, I told you that. Um, I was going to give you a very old word about choice. How often in the media do we hear about choice? A choice for this, a choice for that. Everybody likes choice. But I want to give you a word about choice that's so old and so universal that I believe it had something to do with a lot of the origins of man. It's taken from the book of Deuteronomy. And it was this, and it supposedly came from God. And he says, 
this day, oh, and it really goes with the word influence. I hope you hear it at the level at which it's intended for this. Imagine a voice, let's say, from the netherworld, from the stars above, is speaking aloud from the heavens. You can't see a person. You just hear the voice. And that voice from up in the stars says this to you. This day, I call the heavens, and I want you to think again of the stars, influence, and the ethers up in heaven. This day, I call the heavens witnesses against you that I've set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Now, choose life that you and your children may live. Choose life that you and your children may live. I thought it was very interesting that it not only spoke to us, but it speaks to those that come after us. It speaks of time moving forward and advancing. We don't realize with all the words we get, they're usually catchphrases about choice, that really the ultimate choice is to choose life and blessings and to think of ourselves as an energy source, an energy repository where every day we have that energy available to us. And are we going to give it away to things that bring death and let's say cursings, which someone best described to me as cursings being those things that are blockages to our blessings and life. And I really like the way that sounded. And you could think of death being the same thing. It's a removal of all the elements of life that we have. But think about that as your ultimate question at the morning, every day when you wake up. I have a choice today. I can choose life and blessings, or I can choose cursings and death but I'm going to choose life that I can enjoy my life and my children as well may live or those that follow after me may live. So I want to give you some further examples. And these were things that came to mind as I was preparing this latest podcast. I recently met over coffee with a friend. I hadn't seen her in several years, but uh, I knew we needed to get together. And she shared with me something rather interesting, but maybe you think, well, more, maybe it's a little bit mundane, and maybe this speaks for so many people today. She said, Maura, did you know that for the past five to seven years, I have so badly wanted to leave my place of employment? She'll be leaving soon. And she said, Maura, uh, well, first of all, let me tell you what she did. Not that it matters too much because you could put it into any arena, but she's in the financial area of an institution of higher learning. This woman is very observant, and I mean very observant. She knows what's going on around her. She's bright. She's knowledgeable. She's also a natural researcher. And what she witnessed over a period of many years at her employ was increasing trends They went against her values. They were, they were really disturbing her sense of equilibrium. And it was something that was happening at a more and greater, let's say, increasing intensity over the course of time. She was specifically noting that money was being distributed and misused and wasted that the institution she was working for was failing to focus on its stated reason for existence, namely the students, that the students were lacking guidance. Many of them were using money that should have been used for an education and instead spending it or let's say blowing it elsewhere. And they were not coming out with the appointed degrees that they were supposed to be getting. But there were several other things that she saw And at various times, she would make note of it to her superiors. And she said it really disturbed her that no one was taking note, that no one was using their position of influence to make the necessary changes to make things better. In her job, she said, though, it was it was weighing on her so heavily that she noted that it was affecting her health. It was affecting 
her emotionally, many things that she couldn't necessarily express at work. She would go home and she said her personality was not good at home. And she said it was really having a very deleterious effect on her life. I will tell you this further. She said, you know, Maura, she said, um, my husband, she said, I kept telling him for such a long time, please, I'd really like to leave. And he said, but I'd really like for you to stay. We could use the money. And she said, you know, more, I just kept praying to God. And she said, one day my husband just said to me out of the blue, you know what? I think it's time for you to leave that job. But I will tell you this in, well, I'm going to share it later because I've got some positive things that come after it. But there's an example of being in a work environment where the energy, the life force was being drained. It was being drained because this woman didn't agree her value system, her ethics, her sense of propriety, or what should be done within this institution wasn't being done. And it was really disturbing her. And I know that's a, that's a picture of what goes on in this idea where in the old world, things like money, power, and control were let's say the presiding or prevailing sentiments inside the matrix or the net that we were all living in. Okay, I want to tell you another thing that came to mind that I thought, oh, this was an interesting story too. And it'll give you a picture of how so many people have been in a place where they felt so incredibly constrained that it was even affecting them at highly unusual levels. A few years ago, I was at The Hague in the Netherlands and I was speaking at a women's conference. And while there, I had the, I would, I would tell you this, it was the pleasure of having dinner with a very lovely woman from Slovenia, spoke perfect English. I call her the equivalent of what we would have here as a federal judge here in the United States. And her father apparently was a very prominent judge in Slovenia. She was following in the family line, and she eventually became a judge. Now, I'd put her maybe in her mid-40s, married, children, and uh, you would look at her and think, oh, she's a very bright woman. Well, she confided me in me over dinner. She said, Maura, she said, I can't even describe to you what it feels like for me every day in that position that I've been in. She said, I'm in the judge's chambers, and she said, I've got to put the black cloak on, the judge's cloak. And she said, I put it on, I leave my judge's chambers, and I walk down a long hallway until I could get to the courtroom. And she says, as I walk down the, the hallway, she said, I have an out-of-body experience nearly every morning. She said, I am so opposed. She said, everything about what I'm doing is not who I am. It's not where I want to be. She said, I'm aware of the fact that people may look at me and think, oh, what an accomplished woman. What a great profession to be in. She said, for many, it probably is. She said, it is not my calling. And she said, I've been doing this for so many years. And she said, the level of, I would say, um, uh, disassociation that I have is so incredible to think that I put that cloak on and I'm so appalled by it that literally I feel like I jump out of my body and I'm alongside myself walking down the hallway because I so I, I so abhor the life I've been living. Now, I will tell you this because you know I always tend toward the positive. She was actually at this conference because she had come up with a creative idea to exit her old career and enter into one that she felt had more life to it, more purpose to it, more meaning to it. And it might have required a lot of her energy, but it was a means for her of taking her energies, which she felt were so depleted, and applying them somewhere else. Now, this could be one, of, one or more of you who are listening today. I told you that I was going to talk about the hologram, because you'll see in today's podcast, as we're talking about your influence in the now, we talked about um, your influence being an energy and also being something that could be 
taken, let's say, by something else unwittingly, or given away, let's say, or kept by you and being applied, or let's say reapplied in a direction in which you find life and blessings and something that you feel you like to apply yourself to. Well, let's talk a little bit about the hologram because all of this goes together or works together and forms a single unit, let's say, of thought. Well, a hologram, hopefully you would all know that you've all seen it. My earliest recollection of a hologram was a watch I got from my grandfather. Maybe I was four or five years old and I loved it. And as I moved it, I, there was a little face. It wasn't even a watch. I think it was, it might've been a watch, but there was a hologram within it. And it was a picture of a, a clown. And the clown was Uh, playing with balls. I guess the balls were going around in a circle and he was just, you know, transferring them from one hand to another. And so I would remember looking at this hologram with such, um, I guess, such fascination. That's probably a good word for it because it was so lively. Well, I never forgot that picture of it. Holograms are in the field of of optics and they're actually a three-dimensional image. It's of something that's formed when a negative picture, let's say, is produced by exposing a high resolution photographic plate without the use of a camera or lens near the subject illuminated by monochromatic coherent radiation as from a laser. Now, obviously, you know I got that one from the dictionary. But if you've ever seen a hologram, what it is It's something that actually appears as if it's got depth to it. It's not just one dimensional. It'll look 3D and you could sometimes walk around a hologram and it's quite a marvel. I think it is. In fact, I have one friend who teaches remotely at various university settings and I remember her telling me several years ago, she said, you know more, they actually bring me in as a hologram. She said, so I appear on a stage as a hologram. People could look at me, they could walk around to me and I'm really not even there, but they can see me as a three-dimensional hologram. Now, I thought that was pretty, that's pretty fascinating as an image. It's not her real self. It's a 3D illusion. Keep that in mind, a three-dimensional illusion, the hologram. Now, a hologram to us can appear to be our whole world, a three-dimensional world that appears before us. We can turn around, we can move, and everywhere we are, the hologram is right there with us. We can sometimes be living inside of a hologram. And I'm using that term because you can call it your matrix. You could call it the spider's web that you are living in or connected to or seemingly attached to that at some level feels like it's the whole world when maybe it's not everything we think it is because it's not really solid and it's not really real. Okay, I want you to think about that, okay? Now, about maybe 30 years ago, there was a woman that um, I met with. I was, she was a, I was a perfect stranger to her, but I remember hearing her speak on a number of outlets here in the Tampa Bay area. She didn't live in our area, but periodically she would come into Tampa Bay and she would do interviews. Now, I want to tell you it was a different world 30 years ago. The woman at the time was well into her 70s, maybe 76. She was a little bit of a thing and she was very, very feisty. She also had three PhDs. She was so intelligent that she could read three to four books in a day. And you would think, oh, more, that's that's not important. That's not possible. And yet there are some people in the world that are, they are exceptionally talented in certain ways. Well, I remember listening to her And she was a researcher. She had this ability to take so much information about what was going on in the culture, in various institutions, in aspects of life, whether it was the political arena, the educational arena, um, the media, society at large. And because of all the research and the learning she had done, 
um, maybe that others really had not done or synthesized. This woman was more than a walking encyclopedia. And uh, I would call her a woman that was really a futurist of sorts. She could, knowing all that she knew, she could envision where society was moving, let's say, into the future. Well, I don't know how it was that I was able to reach her, but I wrote to her, contacted her once, and this is even before the internet. And I said, doctor, you don't know who I am. I know you come here periodically. I said, but can I offer to have you stay with us at our home? I'd love to treat you to dinner, have you here as our guest, and also learn a little bit about you. Well, sure enough, the woman took me up on my um, on my request and I was delighted. And um, just to tell you as a little aside, I had a book that I gave her that night. And so she was with us that afternoon, that evening, that night, and she left the following morning. I gave her a book and I said, I'd like for you to read this. I said, whenever you're finished, if you find it of interest, let me know what you think. Well, would you believe by the following morning at breakfast, she had already read the whole book, had summarized the whole thing and gave me all of her comments about it. And I thought, oh, this woman is something else. Well, I do not remember the question I asked her, but I never forgot her answer. And I want you to relate her answer to the picture I just gave you of the hologram and the impressions or the thoughts you might have had if you've ever watched the Matrix movie or can imagine it inside your head. This is what she said to me, Maura, as her response. Everything you see playing out on a national and international level are concurrently taking place in your own community. It's the same antics, the same games, the same operations, even the same corruption. And she said, anyone who ever wants to make a difference in their greater world need only to make a difference in their own neighborhood. I think I might repeat it again. Everything you see playing out in a national and international level or scale are taking place concurrently in your own community. It's the same antics, the same games, the same operational ent entities or processes, even the same corruption. And anyone who wants to make a difference in the greater world need only to make a difference in their own neighborhood. Now, I think I told you at the beginning of this that I was going to share with you the secret of the hologram. I'm going to call it a secret because when I learned this, it told me so much about our world and it also reinforces the very wise words from this woman who is probably long gone because she'd be well over a hundred by now that everything that happens on a small scale is repeated everywhere on the larger level. One of the secrets, I'm calling it a secret, of the hologram is this. If you were to take the slightest sliver or piece of a hologram and separate it from the rest of the hologram, normally when you see something, let's say a picture, you would only get one tiny little piece of a picture but not so with a hologram. Every single slice or piece or entity of a hologram contains the entire picture of the hologram within it. Think about that. If there were thousands of pieces to a hologram, every single one of those pieces would contain the entire hologram within it. The only difference is the perspective at which you are looking at the entire picture. You might be looking at it from down below or up above from a different angle, but it has the entire hologram within each and every small piece. So think about that with your world and the world that we're all living in. This world we may look at and think it's so overwhelming. Some of us may look at it and think, 
It's so rotten or so evil. I wish we had a better world. But where in the world can I start? How can somebody as small as myself ever make a change, ever make a difference? Because it's always the world I feel that's happening to me. Well, what if I were to say to you that the world happens the way it does because at some level we've given it our assent. We've unwittingly unwittingly given it our own energies where we've acquiesced. We've allowed something that we don't agree with, let's say, or something that we're not in alignment with to draw from us an energy that they or it may not have if we didn't give it our energy. Because the system may be like an intelligent machine that has no life of its own, but requires the energy within our lives to give it a sense of life and being, when in reality it's nothing more than a sense, a sense of a permanent illusion. Think about that. So, You can actually, and I, can actually use your influence, your energy, your personal power source to effect positive change in the world in which you're living. Remember when um, I gave you just a bit ago the words from heaven about, I'll give it to you again, the words from Deuteronomy that say, you could tell I'm moving my pages here that say, this day I call the heavens as a witness against you, that I've set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Now choose life that you and your children may live. Choose life because you have the influence, you have the energy, you have the power and it lives inside of you and that very power is the ability to influence and have an effect upon the destiny of others in your midst. So I want to share with you a couple of things. Starting with this, the woman who I told you who for seven years wanted to leave her position in the institution of higher learning, who was so vexed by the poor management of funds and the people or the system, let's say, that continued the propagation of the mismanagement of funds and the failure of many people to actually get through the system or to get through the system and have too much in the way of bills to pay when they were finished. Well, She told me one day that she changed her mind. She learned to see the positive side of what was happening at work to her, knowing that not all was under her control, but she had the ability to control the way in which she looked at things and that she did not have to react or feel negative about things, let's say, that were beyond her control for the length of time that she was at that position in the finance department. What she said to me is that she made a goal up and I thought this was fantastic and I thought it's so simple. Anybody could do it, but they could do it in their own way. She said, Maura, my goal was to make three people laugh during each workday. She said, sometimes I'll, I'll, it, it's a joke. Other times it's a funny story. And she said, still other times it's a happy dance. And she said, what it does is it changes my energy and it changes the energy of those around me. So see, she's still in the same environment, but she managed to utilize and retool some of her own personal energies to give herself yet more energy rather than to feel so, I want to say depleted. And you know what word's coming to mind? Defeated. So she re-energized herself. And she also told me that a friend taught her how to smile inside. And she said, you know, Maura, that was not only good for me, but it was good for my body to learn how to smile on the inside. Because sometimes you would know this, some of you listening, you know that you're in an environment where you can't even express outwardly what you're thinking. But you should keep that in mind. You can always smile on the inside. 
And she also told me that she's writing a book on life lessons that she could pass along to others. And I thought, isn't that great? She's literally taking many of the things that she experienced, and she's experienced quite a lot because she's come here from another country, so her perspectives are quite broad and unique. And she's helping other people, let's say, move along more quickly in life than they might have otherwise. Okay. Here's another thing that I wanted to share about energy and why are we giving it away or having it depleted or having what is actually stopping life and blessings from coming to us because of our own lack of choice or choosing wisely. Um, I'm sure most of you listening today, no matter where you stand politically or otherwise, know that if you tune in to the news you will get upset. You will get angry. You will become agitated. You will feel defeated. You will feel accosted. And I will tell you that that's precisely why people watch it. It didn't matter if it's on one side or the other because that's what the news does. I learned a long time ago from one of the ombudsman organizations for the news and uh, someone who gave a really good um, explanation about reporting. They said, you know, sometimes if I spend a lot of time doing a piece that doesn't get people angry, I only get a few eyes on it. But then sometimes I could write something that just is a shock piece and it'll get so much material, so many followers. And I remember this man saying, he said, it's actually kind of disappointing for me. He said, because there's some things I feel so strongly about, and I wonder why people don't pay attention to it more than some of the shock pieces. Well, I'll also tell you too, for whatever it's worth, and I'm sure many of you already know this, but for those who don't, over 90% of all media is owned by five corporations. And so when you think that you're getting upset watching the news and you're upset about the other people that the news is convincing you are your enemies, know that it's the same organization that is playing the opposite side or the seemingly opposite side of the population base to feel the same way about you. Well, the story I wanted to give you was my own. Um, you would not know this, but my husband had um, suffered a very bad virus a couple of years ago, just before COVID came out, and it really badly affected his heart. So at night, before he'd go to bed, he would tune into the news, like so many Americans would do. And I'm sure people do this in other countries as well. He'd be lying on the couch, and he'd flip back and forth between various news stations. It would be the last thing he'd do before he'd go to bed, and he would get so agitated. And I remember thinking, this man's got a heart issue. The last thing he needs is to be further agitated. It was not adding to his life, this news, because it was agitation. Even more than information, it was agitation. And it didn't matter what station he was listening to, because the energy coming out of the news on opposing stations was the same negative energy just directed differently to different audiences. And I said to him on a number of occasions, that's it, why don't you just stop watching it? Watch something else or turn it off. And then one day I said to him, why don't we just pull the plug on this um, on this whole thing with uh, the cable TV? Well, he hemmed and he hawed. And then ultimately, he did just that. He removed cable TV. And it was a couple of months later. He said to me, Maura, you know what? He said, this is really pretty crazy. He said, we haven't watched TV at night. I'm not watching the news. And he said, and I feel so much better. And I had a laugh. Now, I will tell you something further. I don't know whether TV or the lack of TV played a part of it. But his heart is in much better condition. So I want you to think about that, and I want you to also consider the fact that there are a few corporations that manage the news and manage the energy, and let's say even the negative energy that's being drained from you by following it as if by habit, maybe my husband's case, maybe a desire to feel informed, um, maybe for some of you, it may be even a sense of an addiction, 
like an adrenaline rush, but a negative one where you need the daily, the daily issue of what do I need to be afraid of today? What do I need to be fearful of? Who do I need to dislike today? What do I need to be offended by today? So keep that in mind and know you too have a choice and it's possible. In fact, it's more than possible. It's entirely possible for you to remain very well informed without having to feel agitated by watching things you don't like. So beyond that, I want to give you a couple of other things to conclude this podcast with when we're getting back to your influence in the now. And again, I want you to think, what if you've been plugged in, your energy has been plugged into the system of the old world, and that old world is marked by money, power, control, conquest of you, a draining of your energies, and it's not really giving you life. And you can say to yourself, how can I start to unplug myself? What choices can I make that I have within the realm of possibilities for me in the here and in the now? And he's, here were some of the ideas that I had. I already mentioned you can turn off the TV or you can turn the channel. You can find something that when you watch it, when you're listening to it, when you're taking it in, actually makes you feel better, that brings you life, that makes you feel happier, that makes you feel like you're in the realm of possibilities rather than the realm of impossibility and closure. Something else you could do, you can stop joining in or laughing at maybe crude jokes maybe unkind or obscene stories that you don't particularly agree with. You can limit or leave certain social groups whose energies deplete rather than add to your life. Because when you add yourself to those energies you don't like, you are removing the energy from yourself. And that energy belongs to you. You at whatever level, can make some choices to apply your energies in places that give you life and feelings of life. Next, you can speak up or maybe refuse to go along with various suggestions that go against your values and beliefs. Now, it doesn't mean you have to have a banner in your arm, but you can just say, no, I think I'll, I'll sit this one out. And I'm sure if you haven't done it before, maybe it's something you might want to do. You can speak up or, oh, I think I just gave you that one. You can be a voice for others who need one. One of the best examples would be if you are in school and then you graduate from school and you knew some things were going on in that school that you didn't like. Well, once you're out, you can be a voice, let's say for some of those students that might be suffering. Let's say you were part of a company or an organization, but you're no longer under the control of that entity. You're on the outside now, and you could look at other people who are on the inside, and you could know the suffering that they're under, and you can somehow lend your voice as a voice to those who have no voice, as an advocate. Okay, if you do think about yourself as an energy source and influence, you can decide to add your energy to things that tend to life and to things that bring life. And conversely, you can withhold your energies and your influence and your power from things that deplete life, things that manipulate through power, money, control, and conquest. And here's the other thing too. You realize that everybody is living in a different place. Some people have a lot of latitude. Some people have little or seemingly almost no latitude in life. But remember, you can always choose inwardly to smile. You can always choose inwardly to remove your agreement with something, even if outwardly you're going through certain motions. For some of you, you're retooling and you're reappointing 
and redirecting of your energy can be as small as 1% of your power and as much as 100%. But know that whatever it is you're doing to take back your energy and to apply your energy to things that give you life and to things that you can use it within your own life to bring life to those around you are making a difference in the matrix and the hologram. You may think you're just 1%, that you're only making 1% of a difference, but your 1% difference is affecting the energy and the energies of the entire world in which we've been living. Oh goodness, where do I want to know? Where do I want to go with this? You can help hasten and trans and help the transition by taking your energy away from things that are draining you and reapplying it or reapportioning it elsewhere to things that give you life and accelerate and bring life. And when you do that, you are also helping to make the transition from the old world of money, power, conquest, control, and into the new world of things like harmony, trust, the awareness of humanity around the world and having good feelings toward your fellow man, an era of transparency where there are no more secrets. That's what you can help do within the bigger picture because remember, everything that's happening on a national and international level is happening in our own communities. You can make the difference. One small step begets another. And you can help brighten the way for others by showing them how to redirect their energies, even as you do it with your own. Well, that is all for this episode called Your Influence in the Now. I hope you stay tuned because our next letter, we're getting down to the wire, is the letter C. I have no idea of what C is going to stand for yet, but I know that something in it will ultimately be for good. So stay tuned for that uh, in the ABCs of now and be sure to share this with a friend. I really hope you do. Until the next time, this has been Maura with Maura for you. Bye-bye.